Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef and I am thrilled you're here. And we have a real treat today. And it's a real treat because this gentleman uh, is, is, is part of the Bigger Pockets family. And if you, haven't, if you haven't listened to the Bigger Pockets podcast, then I don't know what rock you've been hiding under. But it's been them or me in the first place spot under real estate on iTunes for the last three years. It's usually them first place. And every so often I sneak ahead, but very rarely. They are like the 800-pound gorilla in the real estate space. But the gentleman I'm interviewing today, his name is Jay Scott, and he actually is the co- um, host of their business podcast, Bigger Pockets Business. And so this is going to be a real treat for a whole lot of reasons because um, we're going to talk business today and we don't talk about that much on this podcast. But but what is, you know, if you're going to do this, if you're going to do this multifamily, let me rephrase that. When you do this multifamily game, it, it, it is a business. You're taking off your your employee hat and you're putting on your entrepreneur hat and you got to turn this into a business. So we're going to have a lot of fun. So, so let me tell you a little bit about Jay Scott. He's written lots of books, I think four books and sold over 200,000 copies. He's did a book on flipping houses. And, and again, he's co-host of the bigger pockets uh, business podcast. Um, and he's, you know, built, rehab, sold uh, somewhere in excess of $50 million worth of property, loaned money on it. It's got a website called 123Flip. We're not going to talk about flipping today because that's not the this, this syntax here, but we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm really looking for this converse, conversation. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. Oh, that's so kind of you to say that. So, you know, let's, why don't, why don't we do it, start like we always start, which is having you tell my listeners a little bit about you and before we dive right into questions and having fun. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I started, my wife and I started in the corporate world for a long time. Back in 2008, we decided to get married and we were both doing that typical big corporate thing, working 80 hours a week, traveling all the time. It just wasn't conducive to starting a family. So back in 2008, when we decided to get married, we said, got to cut this out. We got to do something that is more lifestyle oriented, something that would allow us to focus on the family, having kids, raising kids, um, but also would allow us to continue to make money and to continue to build our nest egg. So uh, long story short, we fell into real estate. We quit our jobs, moved from the West Coast, Silicon Valley to the East Coast. Um, and back in 2008, we kind of fell into real estate at what was a lot of people say the worst time in history to be investing in real estate <laughs> and flipping houses. Um, turned out that it actually wasn't the worst time in history. It was actually very good. A lot of people were scared. Best time. Absolutely. As far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. People ask me what my key to success is. And honestly, if I had to rank them, the number one would just be pure timing. timing. And luck. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know what I didn't know back then. I, I didn't jump in because I said, this is the perfect time to be in real estate. I just kind of fell into it. And I look back 10 years later and I realized I was tremendously fortunate that the timing was just perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was hiding underneath a rock then. You know, I, I had 800 houses here in Florida and several apartment complexes in 08 and 09 and I got my ass handed to me and I lost it all. Lost $50 million. I don't know if you knew that, but you know what else is kind of cool about, about Jay here is that uh, he moved to Sarasota and he's actually living in the same freaking subdivision that I used to live in, which is just awesome. So, so you know, I, I can't wait to have lunch with you, brother. But, but yeah, no, you know, I was hiding underneath a rock I, I, and I, it was such a missed opportunity, but I was licking my wounds for a few months and then I really didn't even want to think about real estate for a short while. But uh, so, so um, you've also been involved in business. Yes. I mean, t talk about your, I mean, corporate business, obviously, yep. uh, you know, they invited you to host their business version of, of the bigger pockets podcast, which I'm really uh, interested to talk about. Can you, can you, can you speak to that a little bit and maybe some of the topics that you cover on your show? Yeah. And absolutely. then, and then let's, then let's see what we can do to add value to my listeners about, you're creating a multifamily business. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. So my background is uh, I spent most of my career at Microsoft. Um, mm. I, I managed one of their businesses. They had an interactive television business. So anybody that's familiar with um, wow. like uh, TiVo, TiVo it, was, it was basically oh, a TiVo-like right. business um, that Microsoft ran. Um, 
long time ago. So I managed part of that business for a long time. Um, I did some M&A mergers and acquisitions at, at Microsoft. And so that was my kind of corporate experience. My wife and I have been partners forever. She ran marketing at eBay for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. So we kind of both came out with this, this great business. Like I, I was a product guy. She was a marketing person. So we kind of went into business together in 2008 and we've started a number of businesses. So we're best known for being house flippers probably because I wrote the book on flipping right. houses. Um, and I've talked a lot about flipping houses. A lot of people, we don't talk about it as much, but we've bought several businesses. We run several businesses. Um, and so that's kind of business is a passion for us. And we like to talk about the fact that as real estate investors, we don't think of ourselves as real estate people. We're business people who happen, one of our businesses happens to be real estate. And you said it yourself, as multifamily investors, as any investors, first and foremost, you're a business person. And for some reason, I think real estate kind of gets this, this reputation that, yeah, you can do it as a hobby. You can do one or two deals and you can make some money. And yeah, that's true. You can, but true real estate investors, real real estate investors are actually business people. And the houses or the apartment complexes or the mobile home parks or whatever it is you're dealing with, that's just your inventory. And you could be buying and selling shoes. You could have a shoe store. You could be a restaurant that's buying and selling food. Uh, You could be a car dealership buying and selling cars. Those are, that's your inventory as real estate investors, houses, apartments, mobile homes, whatever, that's our inventory. And so we have to think if we really want to scale our business, if we want to optimize our business, if we want to minimize our risk, if we want to set ourselves up for success, we have to first and foremost, think of ourselves as business owners. And Couldn't we agree to, more. And we need to treat our investing as a business. And if you do that, you're going to find that you're a lot more successful. You're a lot less stressed. You can scale your business better. You can put in fewer hours, but accomplish more. And most of all, you can minimize a lot of the risk. Not that real estate is tremendously risky, but any business is risky. But if you treat your business like a business, you can mitigate a lot of that risk. Yeah, I love it. You said a lot. And, and I want to circle back on a couple of quick things. Number one, guys, you know, most of you, aspiring to get into this business who still have your core W2 job, still, you know, still out there doing, and, and this multifamily gig is a side hustle. It is critical that like uh, Jay just said, you've got to take off your employee hat and put on your entrepreneur hat because it is a business. And any business, by the way, is nothing but people and systems. Um, Peter Drucker said any business is innovation and marketing. And I agree with that as well. But it really is your ability to create systems so that you, you have lifestyle. And in fact, I'm dealing with that right now in my thought leadership business. You know, we've got lots of coaching students. I do these three-day live events. And by the way, guys, LA, the early bird tickets are almost sold out. Be sure you get your, go to rodinlosangeles.com and get your tickets. We will sell out totally. Uh, those tickets are cr- really going like crazy for that event. And as you know, it's just me three day, for three days teaching you about this business. So make sure that uh, you get your tickets soon. Um, but, but any business, and, and I'm working on that in my thought leadership business right now. I just hired a pretty much a whole C-level team um, to, to, to implement, uh, you know, I've got a COO, C, uh, really a co-CEO, C, chief marketing officer, um, chief financial officer, and, and a VP of sales. And so we are right in the process of setting up and, and implementing our systems and our KPIs, our key performance indicators to, to build our business. In fact, we're introduced, we're... Um, using the EOS system, which I'm sure you talk about on your podcast uh, the, from the book Traction, and, and that's what we're using to get our business going. But, but the, the key thing here is, and, and you talked about this before we started recording, you were flipping 50 houses, I think you said, I don't know what period of time, but, but you were working five hours a week. So, lifestyle is another component. You want to talk about that for a minute, Jay? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, remember, we left our corporate jobs. We were, we were literally with stock and options, left seven-figure jobs to start another business. And we weren't doing that first and foremost for the money, if, we, if it was just the money we cared about, we would have stayed at our W-2 jobs. Um, we left because we wanted to be able to put our family first and our lifestyle first. So yeah. for us, we still wanted to make a lot of money, but if we couldn't do that without systematizing our business, without putting processes in place that allowed us to work a whole lot less than that 80 hours a week we we're doing in our corporate jobs, we were doing it for nothing. 
So, so we needed to figure out how to have, again, a lifestyle business. And, and that's somewhat of a misnomer. I mean, even with the lifestyle business, you need to be a business owner. You need to focus on your business. That needs to be an, an important part of your life. Um, but we needed to figure out how to accomplish everything we wanted to accomplish in not a lot of time. Yeah, and I'll tell you, my greatest regret in life, many of you have heard me say this before, especially if you've seen me speak live, is I'd come home, I had a house on Casey Key here, big $8 million, I call it testament to my ego that I built here, and I'd come home and play with my kids, but I was distracted every single time. It's my greatest regret in life to this day. My kids, um, you know, uh, they help at my live events, and and and, and they, they'll tell you I was a great dad, but I didn't live up to my own expectations. So I, I didn't get this memo until later in life. And so, um, you know, this is really important, guys. I know if you're, a lot of you listening are hungry, you got blood dripping from your teeth and you want success no matter what. And I'm here to tell you, don't give up what's more important. That's those relationships that are in your life to, to achieve that success because it's not success. Um, so, Let's talk about um, let's talk about some of the components of a business. Let's talk about um, some of the maybe maybe you can give some strategies around um, uh, around building a successful business. And I wrote down some some topics here, like like because uh, we just by the way, guys, we just came up with this right before the call. I'm like, hey, you know, your business primarily single family and flipping. How are we going to add value to my listeners? And we're like, and he's and I'm like, and he said, how about business? I'm like, hell yeah, because that's really what this is. So I wrote down hiring. I wrote down culture, marketing, branding, you know, building reach. So why don't we start with 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 the, the hiring piece, the, the, the people piece, because that really is, would you agree, one of the biggest pieces in any business? Absolutely. But if you don't mind, I actually want to step back one level above that. Okay. Um, because everything you mentioned is tremendously important when it comes to building and growing and scaling and optimizing a business. Right. But there's one thing that I found needs to come first. Okay. And that is understanding the components, the key, I, I call them segments. So understanding the key segments of your business. And this is something that a lot of small business owners, a lot of investors, they never think about. But if you go to a medium sized company, if you go to a big company, the first thing you're going to notice is that the company is broken down into pieces, into segments, into uh, all, all teams or groups, whatever you want to call them. So for example, for example, you're going to have the marketing department. Mm -hmm. You're going to have the sales department. You're going to have a product group. You might have an engineering group. You might have a quality assurance group. You might have a customer service group. Finance. Finance, exactly. Mm -hmm. You have all these different groups. You might have 20 or 30 groups if you're in a big enough company. Mm -hmm. And what you notice is that people are dedicated. People do their jobs. So you walk into the marketing department and the people in the marketing department, what are they focused on? They're focused on marketing. They're not writing software. They're not doing quality assurance or testing. They're not, um, they're, they're not like defining the product. They're not the legal team. They're marketing. And you right. walk into the engineers group. The engineers aren't focused on accounting. They're not focused on the marketing. They're focused on writing the code. So we need to be doing the same thing in our business. The first thing we need to do in our business is we need to define what these departments, or I call them segments, are in our business. So let's talk about them as they relate to multifamily, if you don't mind, Jay. So what are some examples of segments in the multifamily space? Sure. So some of the big segments in the multifamily, space, and again, every business, depending on how you run your business, how you think about your business, is going to be a little bit different. Sure. And before, I, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. But let me throw out a strategy that people can do to kind of figure out what's right for their business. Because awesome. if, I, if I throw something out, everybody's going to say, okay, those are my segments. They may or may not be. But okay. one of the things I like to do every time I start a new business and I want to figure out what these segments are, I take a sticky pad, just these small sticky notes, and I write down every single task that I can think of in the business. So in my flipping business, it was, I need to find properties. I need to find contractors. I need to close deals. I needed to get inspections. I needed to do this, this, this. Financing, and, equity. And, exactly. And mm -hmm. if you break it down small enough, you can literally get hundreds or thousands of these sticky notes. Hmm. Then you take those sticky notes and you start putting them up on the wall mm -hmm. and you start organizing them in just some fashion that makes sense. And what you're going to find is that at the end of the day, you're going to have two or three or five or 10 big buckets of sticky notes. These are your departments or your segments. In my flipping business, I had four of them. 
So my flipping business, I had acquisition. So mm-hmm. everything that went into finding properties and in the multifamily space, acquisitions sure, is acquisitions going to be, a, gonna be a, one. a core component. Mm-hmm. In my flipping business, I had my second piece was rehab. Mm-hmm. Rehab. Yeah. Remodel. Yeah. So, so everything that had to do from the day I closed on the property to the day that it was ready to be put back on the market. Third piece in my business was disbursement. So marketing and sales. So basically everything that happened from the day the property was ready to be put back on the market to the day that the property was closed, the day we actually got our check. And then the fourth bucket was all the fundraising. Mm-hmm. And so in my flipping business, those were my four segments. Every single task that I did day in and day out over a decade fell into one of those four buckets. I never found a task that didn't fall into one of those four buckets. Now, in the multifamily space, your buckets might be a little bit different. And two people- Well, let's talk, multi- I'll, let's talk yeah. about some of those. I'll throw some out Absolutely. and we'll, we'll, we'll riff back and forth on this. So, yeah. of course, you're going to have acquisitions. So, yeah. But, there, of course, there's going to be a lot of pieces under that. Broker relationships, maybe direct-to-seller marketing. So, there's going to be lots of subcategories. I love the way that you simplify it, though, because yeah. that, that takes the big and makes it small. And you need to do that in your mind as well. So this is a very powerful exercise. Yeah, so you've got to and keep, keep in mind, yeah, after you get these segments, you have to define your sub, sub segments. So under right. these four, my flipping business, there were 10 or 20 different right. sub segments of each of these. So yeah, a- absolutely. Right. So yeah, acquisition, acquisition is going to have a whole lot of sub segments. Right. And, and, and so, so another, another big category would be finance. Okay. Like, well, another one, let's say due diligence. Okay. So due yep. diligence would be a, it could be a category. It could be part of acquisitions, could be under acquisitions, but it is a big piece. And, and uh, by the way, little plug guys, if you haven't downloaded my, my due diligence book, it's on my website. It is freaking incredible. It's almost 70 pages of every possible question you would ask yourself when you're evaluating a multifamily property and it's freaking free. You know, I used to have my book on there. I gave away 20,000 copies of my book and, and my team finally said, hey, stupid, let's put it on Amazon and make some money. And so it's finally on Amazon. But, but now I've got this thing and it is so good. So, so there's no fluff in it. And it's, it's on the Rod Cleef site. So just go get it. Because what's great about multifamily business is it's primarily empirical. It's numbers. If you, if all things being equal, you ask all the right questions and you get the numbers right, it's pretty freaking hard to make a mistake. So get the book. But, but back to category. So we've got, we've got acquisitions. We've got due diligence. Uh, finance. So in the, in the multifamily space, you're going to have to figure out early on, in fact, before you put a property under contract, what the financing is that you're going to utilize to take down that property. So that'd be a category. And, and, and it, maybe it's just the whole capital stack, including equity, finance, everything could be a category. Um, let's see, what are some other categories? Of course, asset management would be a category. What are you going to do after you buy um, you know, are you going to hire third-party property management? Are you going to do it yourself? That would be a category. Um, and maybe even disposition. Management. What's that? Construction management. Construction, absolutely. Your reposition. Thank you for sure. Uh, how, how are you? You know, are you going to are you going to do it in house? You're going to let the property management company help you with it. You know, how are you going to handle that? So, love it, man. Those, those, that, yep. That's so. So, guys, when you break it down like this, then you really understand the business. So. Once you've got these categories and then you put the subcategories underneath them, Jay, what's next? Yeah, so that's when you jump into all of those things that you were talking about before. Uh, One of the big ones is delegation and actually Mm. finding people to cover each of those areas. Now, a lot of us think, okay, I don't know how to delegate. I don't know who to bring in. I don't know the right people. I don't know the right tasks. What should I have them do? But the nice thing is once you have these segments, once you have these big segments and these sub-segments, it gets much easier to say, let me find somebody. So if you have, let's say one of your sub-segments is construction management, Management, mm-hmm. you can bring in a person whose job it is, is to run that piece of your business. And right. so they're ultimately responsible for putting in place the systems, the processes, the documentation, um, the set of, of, of KPIs for that particular piece of the business. You have another piece of the business that's, let's say, investor relations. You can bring in somebody whose job it is to 
figure out the the staffing of that piece and the documentation of that piece and the and the core KPIs for that piece. Then if the next piece is acquisitions, you can bring in somebody that can do that. Right. Maybe you're doing all of these things yourself, but at least now you have a structure for how you spend your time. I'm going to spend the next four hours working on optimizing the acquisition piece. I'm going to spend the next two days focused on the investor relations piece. So instead of just going back and forth between random tasks, you now have a way of thinking about the pieces of your business and you can say, today I'm working on this or for the next hour I'm working on this piece. And then as your business grows, you'll see opportunities to bring somebody in or bring in multiple people to cover various segments or sub-segments in your business. So, so delegation hiring is absolutely huge. And keep in mind, you don't necessarily have to hire full-time employees. You can bring in partners. You can hire contractors. You can bring I in was part-time just say employees. That. Good. You can bring in temps. So when we talk about delegation, don't necessarily think delegation involves having to hire full-time people because that's expensive. That's difficult. There are lots of solutions for delegating out work. I'm so glad you said that because I was, I was going to, I was going to stop you if you moved on to the next segment, because guys, you don't have to have a, a huge wallet filled with money to hire all these people. Like I said, you can partner and that's how a lot of, that's how most people start, frankly. But let me say this as a caveat before I move past this, you know, partnerships like a marriage, easy to get into and very hard to get out of. And I mean, I, I run, you know, my, my, many of you know I run the multifamily boardroom mastermind. There's almost $6 billion in assets in there. And there are some heavy hitters in there that are splitting up their partnerships. So, you know, it's, it's, and, and they're not always pleasant. So, if you're going to do a partnership, um, I've created this document that's got a bunch of the, all the questions you should ask yourself, the hard questions up front before you get into a partnership. And the first question is, do I really need this partnership? If you want that, DM me on Facebook and I'll, I'll give it to you. So, I'm, I'm I should be, be careful what I wish for. I'm sure my email is going to blow up now. But if you want that, I, I'll give it to you. It's a, it's a list of, I don't know, it's probably about 10 pages of the right questions to ask before you get into a partnership. So, you know, one thing I might add to what you just said, Jay, is, you know, you've got these segments and, and you're looking at who you might need to align with, partner, hire, whatever, to do these things. Do you think there might be some benefit to creating a quasi-org chart around those segments with some blank boxes? Um, and what an organizational chart is, guys, is, is, is taking the different pieces of your business, like on a tree with the, you as the CEO at the top, and then you branch out in all these departments, and your name might be in most of those boxes when you start, but then you can identify who you might want to bring in. Does, would that maybe kind of help a little bit? What do you think? Jay? Absolutely. I okay. mean, this, this, is, this is, imagine your business 10 years in the future and what roles are you going to be filling? Yeah. And like you, like you said, you don't need a name for every one of those positions. Maybe you have 30 different positions on your org, org chart and you're in 29 of them. Maybe you're in all 30 of them, but this gives you a structure for the day you go out and you hire your first person or you partner with somebody or you bring in a temp or you bring in a contractor, you can say, this is your role, this is your position and their name goes there. And then maybe two months later, you bring in somebody else and six yeah. months later, you bring in somebody else. And the, the, the goal is in two or five or 10 years, you now have a full organization that's supporting itself and that has each role filled. It's basically yeah. planning for success and defining what success looks like two, five, 10 years into the future and building your company based on that vision, as opposed to just letting it grow, getting 10 years down the road and saying, oh, wow, the, I have all these people and I still don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, no, that, that, I, I, I agree completely. And, and guys, um, in anything, in life, clarity is power. And the more of this you do in anticipation of building this business of yours in the multifamily space, the more clarity you're going to have. So, uh, this, is, this is really good. I'm really glad we're doing this today, Jay, because we've never done this on the show. Yep. So, so now let's drill down on some of these topics that I mentioned, because again, you and I know that really it is, it is all about the people you bring in, the people you align with. If you're going to partner by God, you know, one thing, let me mention one other thing there, trust your gut, trust your intuition. You know, I'm, 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 I turned 60 in 30 days and, and I've, I've had a lot of great partnerships and I've had some not so great partnerships. And I will tell you almost every time the not so great ones have been when I haven't listened to my gut. Um, so if it doesn't feel right, Trust that, my friends. Okay, very important. Would you agree with me, Jay? A hundred percent. And right. I, I think 
too often we get desperate to bring in people to help us. We get desperate mm -hmm. to find a partner because there's something we don't want to do or can't do, or we get desperate to hire somebody because we just need somebody in a particular role. I mean, we see this with contractors all the time that you interview a contractor. He's like, ah, I'm not sure if he's right, but he's available. Mm -hmm. And, and he says he can start tomorrow and mm -hmm. I just don't have anybody else. So I'm going to hire him. And what you find is you end up spending more time and more money and more stress and more effort and more headache on dealing with that person that seemed like, a, like he could just get the job done, even though he wasn't perfect, than you would have just saying, no, I'm going to wait another two weeks. I'm going to interview more people and find the right person. Yeah. So important. I, I remember I, I was hiring a, a COO for another business. I've built 24 businesses uh, in my lifetime and, and several have been worth a lot of money, and, but most have been seminars and you guys all know what that means. But, but I was going to hire the COO when it was a high level position. I think it was a buck 75 was the salary. And we went to dinner and Tiffy and I, my wife and I took this guy and his wife to dinner and I was ready to hire him. And and, but there was one little thing he did. It was subconscious. It was just a slight bit of arrogance with the wait staff. And I'm like, you know what? I want to dig in a little deeper. And he had had one reference on his, on his resume. He said, don't call this guy because he's dying of cancer. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to call the guy. And he wasn't dying of cancer. And he said, don't hire this guy. He stole from me. You don't want to. And I'm like, and it was just that little thing with the intuition that, that caused it. Anyway, I digress. So, so um, how do you find the best people, brother? What's, what's your advice? Or do you have any, any, any suggestions yeah. around that piece? Yeah. So here's the thing I see too many people, business people, whether it be investors or, or otherwise doing when they're looking to hire, they say- Or, or partner or align. Yeah, exactly. Or that. Right, uh, right. Uh, it, it, this, yes, this fits into any of those. Right. They say, here's what I'm looking to get done. Let's say they say, I need a receptionist. And they say, the receptionist is going to do this. They're going to answer the phones. They're going to do customer support. Maybe they're going to do invoicing. Maybe they're going to do uh, uh, paperwork. Right. All the tasks. All, all the, the tasks. tasks. Right. right. And this could be any role, but let's just right. use that as an example. And then they go out and look for somebody who has experience right. dealing with customers and dealing with, with paperwork and dealing with invoices. And they try and find somebody that has the perfect experience. And in my experience you shouldn't be looking for somebody with the perfect experience. Go find a great employee and figure out a role for them. And it doesn't have to be the role that they've done in the past. It doesn't have to be what they have experience. It's easier to take somebody who is an all around good employee and training them in a task or a role than it is to take somebody who has a lot of experience in a task or a role and turning them into a great employee that fits your culture. Boom. Guys, I hope you heard that. Guys, I, I, I have hired hundreds, literally hundreds of people in my career over multiple companies. And I, and I finally got the memo on this. It took me a while. I will take work ethic and passion and excitement over experience any freaking day. The, techno, the technical side can be taught. You can't teach the work ethic. You can't teach the passion and the excitement about, about the business. You agree? Jake? Absolutely. I, my wife walks around with business cards and we'll be at a restaurant and we'll have a great experience with a mm -hmm. server and she will just hand them a card and say, hey, if you're ever looking for another job, call Boom. me. Me and too. they'll say, well, do the well, what do you do? Thing. What are you looking to hire for? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Just call me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's customer service type people mm -hmm. because our, what we consider one of our main core competencies, what we consider our competitive advantage in all the businesses we start is we strive for amazing customer service. Yep. Um, and so for us, having people that are polished, that, that have the right attitude. That, that care. Are, that care. Yeah. Um, when you find somebody like that, you can train them to do anything. Yep. And yep. It's, yep. A, it's a lot harder to take somebody that's really well trained in something and try and convert them to having your core values. That's just, that's the much tougher Agreed. way to go. Agreed. And guys, you know, there are a lot of books on, on creating culture and core values and a mission statement. Traction is a great one. Uh, the Rockefeller Habits is, I think, where some attraction came from. Uh, we're actually implementing that system, that EOS system out of traction right now into our, uh, into, into my business. It's been, it's been real eye-opening. But, but, the, but the point is, you know, educate yourself on, you're not just going to educate yourself on multifamily, you're going to educate yourself on building a business, on hiring, on sales, on marketing, all these components of a business. But let's talk about culture just because I wrote it down next and something that I believe in. 
you know, when you're, when you're building your business, you do have to have a, a, you as the CEO, you have to have a mission and a purpose in what it is you're trying to accomplish because, and with some clarity, because how the hell are you ever going to rally anybody behind what it is you want to do if you don't know what it is? Would you agree with me? I, I absolutely would. And I'll tell you, I am not the, the, my wife is more the touchy feely marketing, mm-hmm. emotional side. I'm more the, I have an engineering degree and I'm more the analytical one. Mm-hmm. So I've never been big on like vision boards and, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But um, I had the, the, the privilege of interviewing a guy named Cameron Harold. Uh, mm. and- oh, he's a wonderful guy. Okay. I've got his book. I've got yep. his book right here in my briefcase. One yep. of his books. Wonderful guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Cameron's fantastic. So he is, he is kind of the, the COO guy. That's, that's his, mm-hmm. been his role. He grew uh, 1-800, his big claim to yeah, fame. Junk. He, 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 1-800 got junk. He grew right. it to like a, a billion dollar business. Yeah. And, and he runs a, a organization called the COO Alliance, the, mm-hmm. the Chief Operating Officer Alliance. And he wrote a book called uh, Vivid Vision. Mm -hmm. And basically in the book, it talks about um, to basically set yourself up for success in your business, you need to create a vision document and it can be any format you want. It can be a newspaper article. It can be- uh, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt because it's killing me. I literally just hired somebody. I have their contract in my inbox right now to create that vision for me. Literally, it's so funny that you're talking about this. The way the universe works blows my mind. I literally- have a contract in my inbox, came in this morning to have my vision created for my company. So I'm sorry, I, I, it was killing me not to say something. No, that, it, yeah. it's great. And he's fantastic. I mean, yeah. he, was one, he was one of the people I was really excited to have on the podcast when I started yeah. my podcast. And so for anybody out there, pick up this book. It's called Vivid Vision. It's oh, yeah, yeah. His, his, his stuff is awesome. He's got another book called Free PR, which is the one yeah. I have my briefcase right now. In fact, literally, it's, it's right here. So, yeah. I, I, and, 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 so, so that vision and what I'm doing with my company is, is we're going to create, like you, like you said, that vision for the future. And it's actually a document with graphics and it's going to be beautiful. And, and we can show that to a prospective partner or employee or anybody, contractor, that's going to align with us. And they're going to know exactly where my head is at and where I want to take the company. Awesome. I'm really glad you brought that up. And, uh, and not, not only will it align them, but right. you show that to a prospective partner or customer, well, not customer, but uh, maybe even a customer. Yeah, maybe or, a customer. Or, or, or employee. And you say, this is my vision. This is what our culture looks like. This is what we're looking to grow. And they can look at that and they can say, I'm not going to fit in well there. That's, right. that's, right. not, that's not my vision. And that's great. You'd yeah. rather have somebody that, that self-selects out and says, this isn't right for me than somebody that comes in blind and says, this is going to be great. And then they get in there and go, oh no, this guy's, the, his core values just don't align with mine his vision doesn't align with mine so it's it's basically it's a way for you to express everything about you in that business in a way that everybody you work with can either self-select out or say yes i'm on board with this and nobody will ever come into your business and say well i I, when i took the job i didn't expect that no you know exactly what to expect because here's my vision yeah i love it love it yeah i mean i'm I'm really looking forward to that process because they're going to walk us through the whole process and and you know, and the things that I'm passionate about giving back and, and my charitable stuff. And if that's, you know, if that's not you, this isn't going to be the place for you, you yep. know? And, and so, um, so let's talk about branding a little bit, because I would have to say, you know, um, you and I each have done a fantastic job in that arena. Yep. So, you know, in what, what's so amazing about the, the, the place we are in time right now, it's just incredible, the opportunities available to brand. I mean, I've got, you know, I'm on, I'm, <laughs> I try to help brand new podcasters. So I'm literally on probably eight podcasts a week just to try to give them, give them a little juice and push uh, and some advice and stuff. But you want to speak to branding a little bit? Do you? Yeah. Mind? So, so uh, branding is uh, definitely not one of my, Okay, well, four taste, but I'm happy to talk to you. my wife. I've learned a lot from my wife. So my wife has done branding for some of the largest companies in the world. She was at eBay and did marketing and branding. She was at Franklin Covey, the seven habits people. And, wow. And did, did a lot of marketing wow. and branding. So, I, I should have had her on the show for God's sakes, man. I, and you, it's not too late. I'm sure she'd love to come on. Um, but yeah, so, so branding is, and, and this goes along with your vision. So some, right. some key components of branding are one, don't let your brand define itself. Don't mm. let your brand evolve. 
Branding is a decision you make every day. Branding mm. is a way that you decide you want your company to be reflected and you need to build that. Nice. And if, if we let our brand evolve naturally, it's not going to evolve in a focused fashion. And, and so a couple things, you need to be true to your brand. You can't define a brand that's not really you. I can't define a brand that's all about whimsy and, and mm. this and that because I'm, I'm a- You're an engineer, man. I'm an engineer. It's, right, got it. So I need to have something that's aligned with my values and my, my, right. my personality. But once I do that, I need to define what that brand is. And I need to define what that brand is trying to communicate about me, about my business. And then you have to live and integrate that brand into everything you do. It has to be integrated into the people you hire. It has to be integrated into the marketing materials you create. It has to be integrated into your customer communications. It has to be integrated into every facet of your, of your business. And if you can't figure out how to integrate your brand into every facet of your business, then it's not the right brand for you. Right. You know, you know, I, I probably shouldn't have said brand. I should have said create reach because, yeah. because the, there's not a lot of branding around multifamily. It's really more, I mean, yes, I mean, it, you should, you should think about what you're going to stand for and, and, and what your core values are and what your mission is and, you know, at providing quality housing maybe for, for, for your residents. But, but, but really where I should have went with this is, is creating reach because that's really what, where, where, where you've done an incredible job through the bigger pockets family and my podcast, um, you know, with millions of downloads like, like you guys. Um, and, and, and talk about the opportunities to create reach today yeah. because, because the multifamily space, you know, it's a team sport. It requires equity partners. It requires investors, you know, uh, you know, and, 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 and that, to, and it's so easy now to create that reach. You want, you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my, my, MO, I guess you could say, for creating reach and, 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 and doing more and growing and building relationships has always been pretty simple. Um, for me, it's all about giving value. And my, my, my attitude is I, every day my goal is to sincerely give value. There are people out there who say, I'm going to give value and they're doing it with the, the, in the back of their mind. How am I going to get this back? Every time they do something, they're, they're sitting there thinking, how is this going to come back to me? How is this? Gonna, I don't think about how it's going to come back to me. I know that if I give enough value, if I put enough out there to help other people, it's going to come back to me. And it's not- I, I have to stop you because yeah. I have to give you a shout out. Before we started recording, remember I asked you the question, how can I add value to you today? And you said, I'm good, man. I'm just here to, just here to, and so guys, he truly means what he says here. And, 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 and the most successful people on the planet are the ones that add the most freaking value. Yep. So he, he got the memo. I got the memo. I, I mean, and so, so I'll hear this, guys. When you're out there, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Pinterest, Twitter, whatever it is, that's the number one focus, value. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, do, and do it sincerely. Consistent. Consistently and sincerely. sincerely. And, sincerely. and yeah. I learned this lesson. Not, I knew this lesson before then, but it was, it was really driven home. There's a guy named Jay Papazan. And mm -hmm. um, Jay is Gary Keller's partner. So mm -hmm. he's the, he's uh, he runs Keller publishing. So if you've ever read, written any one thing, uh, the, G G Gary Keller is the guy that founded Keller Williams. Brilliant exactly. guy. And, yeah. Okay. And, and so Jay Papazan is the co-author of the one thing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I've had the opportunity to talk to him a few times. I had him on my podcast and I remember the first time I talked to him, somebody introduced us. And the first thing he said when he jumped on and keep in mind, uh, uh, uh Jay Papazan is, I mean, he's a New York Times bestselling author. He's got, he's ridiculously wealthy. He's ridiculously um, successful and, and probably a million people like looking for his time and, and help. And so I get on the phone call with him. And the first thing he says to me is he said, and, and the most sincerely anybody's ever said this to me, he said, what can I do right now to add value to you? And what a great question. I, yeah. And I said, I hadn't. The immediacy even thought, of that question is awesome. Love exactly. That. And I, and what I said to him was, I haven't even thought about, it. is it okay if I think about it? He said, absolutely. And then when there's something, you let me know what that is. And at that moment, I'm sure there are things, there are plenty of things I could have asked him that he wasn't willing to do, but he just, the way he said it was just like, I could have asked for the world and he was, he was willing to give it. And we had about a half hour conversation that first time. And 
it was constantly about how he could help me, how he could provide value, how we could make the most of that discussion so that I would walk away feeling like that was, it couldn't have been worth any more of my time. That was the, the most immense value. And every conversation I have had since that conversation, this was about a year ago, every conversation I've had since then, I've tried to replicate how he made me feel with the other person. And what I found is the closer I can come to actually doing that sincerely, like really just not looking for anything in return, the more I find it comes back to me. Oh, I love it, man. I love it. What a great shout out to Jay Papasan and, and, and just great for me to hear it as, as well again. And, and cause guys, you know, whatever you give, you get, and you guys know this, you've, I've talked about it ad nauseum on this show. Uh, you want happiness, give happiness. You want love, give love. You know, you, you help other people succeed in business. You will succeed in business. It's just, just the way the universe works. Um, so, so, um, how are we doing on time? We've got a little bit of time. Um, I, I, unfortunately I have a hard stop in 15 minutes, but let's no keep problem. going here. Uh, branding reach. So, so give us some secrets to success, Jay. You've super successful in what you're doing. Talk, you know, talk to some of the young people that are listening that maybe haven't bought their first property yet. Know they want to do this, whatever, for whatever reason, they haven't taken action, fear, comfort, limiting, limiting beliefs, whatever. Share, share some wisdom with these, with these aspiring investors. Yeah, here's, here's the biggest piece of wisdom I have for any real estate investors out there that are looking to do their first deal. I meet and I have met, and I'm sure you're, you, you'll probably agree with everything I say here. I've met thousands, maybe tens of thousands of real estate investors and aspiring real estate investors over the past decade. Mm -hmm. And in that time, I found that every single investor that I've met has fallen into one of two categories. They've either done zero deals, and I'd say probably more than half of them fall into the category of having done zero deals, or they've done two or three or five or 10 or 50 deals. I very rarely, if ever, meet an investor who's done one deal. No investors do one deal. You either do zero deals or you do a lot of deals. And the reason for that is as soon as you do that first deal, everything clicks. Everything comes together and you realize, wow, I get it. I understand the formula. I understand what's going on here. And as soon as you do that first deal, that second one comes so much easier. That third one comes so much easier. The fourth one comes so much easier. The 10th and 50th comes so much easier. It's getting that first deal. And what I want to tell everybody out there who hasn't done that first deal is don't stop until you get that first deal. Because once you get that first deal, I promise you, you'll get a second and a fifth and a 10th and a 50th because that's the way it works. Nobody does one deal. Yeah, I, I, awesome, awesome advice. The law of the first deal for sure, because you know, I've got students, that, you know, and, and, and after that first one, they're like dominoes. Now they've got 1,000 or 2,000. They've quit their job. They're, I mean, it's just incredible to see that in action. Uh, the first deal is always the hardest. It's the most stressful. It takes the longest. But, but then you're like, you do it. And you're like, is that all there was? The fear is gone. Now I know how to do it. I love it, buddy. Great advice. Well, listen, I really appreciate you being on the show, my friend. You've had a tremendous value in, on a topic we've never discussed before. So this has really been a treat for me. And, uh, and we got to get together and lunch soon. Christ, Love you're it. in my backyard, dude. Absolutely. So we got to make, we got to make that happen. But I really appreciate you being on the show. And I look forward to getting to know you, my friend. Fantastic. Thanks, Rob. All right. Take care.